I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this morning because there's, in, in business, you know, I, I meet with people all the time and, you know, everybody wants more business, better business, whatever, and yet most business owners tend to get in a, a cycle with their, with their marketing and, and they don't really get, their marketing doesn't really work for them the way they need it to, which is one of the things we're going to go over today and the most of the stuff we're going to be covering is really it, it's a lot of basic type stuff but we need to make sure that we're all on the same page with that hopefully we'll go through the stuff and you guys are you got it all down if so then I've got some um, marketing secrets at the end things that uh, you can use to apply to what you're doing so if time allows we'll get into that and and I, and I have to forewarn you, if we go through these things and you think in your mind, well, I don't have time for that. I, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of something that um, Bernie and I actually had this conversation once, about a year ago. We were talking about some things marketing related, and he said, I don't have time for that. And he got in his truck and drove away. Do you remember that day? I think you're going to make me look bad in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to remember it. <laughs> it's not that bad, Bert. Around that time, there was a YouTube video that had gone viral. Sweet Georgia Brown. Ain't nobody got time for that. Oh. Anybody remember that? I remember the conversation. A couple people. Okay. I think it's gotten like 47 million hits. Um, the, and what it was just a uh, some woman in Oklahoma. You know, her apartment catches fire, and she's getting interviewed by the news people. Well, the interview itself was funny. But then somebody made a parody of it. So it shows the news clip, and then it goes into the song that they made out of the interview. It was funny. Really hilarious. If, if you haven't seen it, you know, Google it. Ain't nobody got time for that. Or actually, you know, it's actually on Bernie's website now. <laughs> because what I did was over the... That, that was, this was like on a Friday, so over the weekend, just for fun, I created a page on the website. It's not navigation, so you, it, it's not something you'll find. And it was about, I took one of his pages about commuting and started it out that, you know, commuting is such a waste of time. And nobody said it better than Sweet Georgia Brown when she said, ain't nobody got time for that. I put the video in there, did an online press release of it, this was a year ago. That press release has gotten, I don't know, like 1,200 unique hits. It still, to this day, gets about four hits a day. And it was just one of those fun things. So as we go through these things, if you think to yourself, I don't have time for that, you should be chuckling and reminding yourself that there's always a way to make time. It's not so much how much time you use but where you're applying your time. One of the things I want to accomplish today in this is to show you how to use your marketing to get yourself a, a consistent sales revenue. Success, the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge, but rather a lack of will. Now, I think we all want to succeed here or we wouldn't be here at 7.30 in the morning when it's freezing outside. Can I hear an amen to that one? <laughs> so, if it's not, I mean, if we know that we all want to succeed, um, there was a presentation that I did recently. Um, one, of the, one of the notes, there's uh, Dun & Bradstreet says that 90% of businesses that fail, fail for lack of knowledge on the owner's part. So we all have the will. We're going to go through some of the knowledge today. Typical marketing cycle. Does this look familiar to some of you? The, um, the red line, it starts up high, goes low, and uh, goes back up. This is typical marketing. Okay, Your sales is this one here. Most people, when sales are low, you spend money on marketing. And as soon as sales start to pick up, you're dropping what you're spending on marketing because you're busy. Your sales are up here. Sound familiar? Well, then 
the sales drop off, so, oh, I gotta start marketing again. And you're spending all this money and then eventually your sales start to pick up. This line in the middle, the yellow line, that's your goal. It's where you want things to be. Now, at the end of the year, maybe you'll end up with the money you wanted, but man, that is a brutal way to get there. It's up and down, up and down, and especially here in this area, in our demographic, so many business owners, they, when we get into the summer, well, I gotta pull my marketing back, it's gonna be slow, you know, so I gotta pull it back. I gotta start saving my resources. Or then you get the ones that in July and August when it's already slow, hey, I don't have money to market. You know, I just can't afford it, okay? Which now you're in a situation where the sales are not high, they're not marketing because sales are high, they're not marketing because sales are low. Explain to me how the sales are gonna go up if you don't market. This is not gonna happen. And then they get into September, and a lot of businesses in our area in September wish the month didn't exist on the calendar because it can be a really slow month. And so they'll stop all marketing. Then they get into season and they're busy and they'll do marketing and they don't even think about where they're spending their money. Like, oh yeah, that sounds good. I'll throw some over there. I'll start throw some over there. None of you can relate to that, can you? Never gone through that cycle. <laughs> it's, that's the typical cycle that we work in here in our, in our demographic. It doesn't have to be that way. So we're gonna analyze a few different things and talk about how to get out of that cycle First thing, what is marketing success? Got to have good leads, right? We're going to delve into that. We have to have consistent sales. We'll cover that one. And we need manageable expenses, okay? Those are the three big things that we're going to be analyzing today. Good leads, consistent sales, manageable expenses. Because if we can't afford it, it's kind of a moot point. I found that when I was putting my own music out with my Twitter feed as the pure marketing budget, I'm preaching to the choir. Now, most of you probably aren't going to know this guy. He's the main guy for Nine Inch Nails, some you know music group. It, it's not about who he is. Are you a Nine Inch Nails fan? No, I'm not. Can't say I'm a fan. I've heard of Okay. <laughs> it um, it isn't so important who the guy is, although he's been around. The point here is that when he's marketing only to his Twitter fans, is he getting any new followers? Is anybody new buying his albums? No. So there's a lot of reasons do you want to use Twitter in your marketing, but you have to look at what the marketing that you're going to do, you have to make sure that you're reaching the right people. So good leads. What is a good lead? They have to have the funds to purchase, right? They need to have the authority to purchase because it doesn't do much good when you're, somebody's calling you and they're just getting information. They're wasting your time. Get to the right person. They're ready to purchase now and they want to purchase. That's kind of important. So, oh yeah, they want something that you want to sell. And it's not necessarily something, just something that you have, but it needs to be something that you want to sell. Has anybody ever had a client that wanted to, or prospect, whatever, somebody that wanted you to provide a product or service that maybe you would have made money, but it wasn't really a product or service that you really wanted to offer? Has that ever happened to anybody? Anybody want to, you want to share on that, Tom? Uh, sure, I get people all the time that just want to come in and say, so tell me the next best stock to buy, and I don't, I don't do the I mean, longer term planning type of thing, so I just, I send them to somebody else is what happens. <laughs> and, and why is, that, that's a good lead for somebody else. That's right. Why is it a bad lead for you? Uh, it's not what I focus on, it's 
about where my uh, best qualities or best skills are or whatever. And it, right. would, it would eat up more time than I could ever charge for it. Okay. The point there that I want to make sure we all understand is know what it is that you should be selling. Because if somebody's coming to you waving money at you and they want to buy something that is not what you should be selling, it's going to keep you from what you should be selling and you're not going to make money. So one of the biggest things that we have to look at when we're looking at the leads that we're getting is are they really the right kind of leads? The first thing that I want to do is I, I want to do some breakouts here where we talk about the quality of the leads we're getting and do they need to be adjusted. Now this shouldn't really be a really long breakout, but this is definitely something that you know we need to do some chatter on. Um, there's only, I'll, I'll join you two over there. So. so just at the tables, those are the two questions that, we'll, that we want to answer. Make sense? About the quantity? No, it's not about quantity. Quantity can always be adjusted. What we want to know is the quality. What is the quality of the leads that you're getting? And, and let me give an example here, okay? Our, what is more important, to have a big business or profitable business? Okay? I, I, act, I know of an individual that she, she began to, she took over operation of her father's business, okay? You know, she went off, to, got a degree and everything. He had this business that was, he was doing about 250 a year gross. Of that, he was running about 100,000 a year profit. That's pretty good, okay? He was working 30 hours a week, making good money. His daughter wanted to take that company to a million dollars. And she wanted to look like they were a million dollar company. She got the company to a million dollars and had all the bells and whistles that go with the million dollar company, but she also had a tremendous amount of debt, which her father didn't have. Do you know what her profit was? Still $100,000. Now, she was working a lot more than what her dad did. She was working literally twice as much, 60 hours a week, where he was working 30. And this went on, it went on, it went on, it didn't correct. So guess what happened? She was just, you know, she was running the company. Dad still owned it. Anybody have an idea what happened? You can't answer, Tom? I do, but <laughs> I've heard the story. Yeah. <laughs> Dad says, this is crazy. I've got all this debt, still making the same amount of money. My risk exposure is ridiculous. I'm over it. You won't fix it. So he went to find somebody else to run the company, and they actually wanted to buy it. She's out of a job. Okay. We're talking about the quality of the leads. Quality. quality of your leads? Um, well, what you suggested was I need to try to identify where all the leads are coming from, which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, so that I can focus on getting rid of the bad ones. So mm -hmm. don't, don't pursue that avenue and then picking up more on the other ones. What we found with Tom, you know, at first it's, you feel like, hey, my leads are pretty good. I'm closing most of them. And we find well, actually, there's a lot of phone conversations that I never sit down with that I push them off to somebody else. I don't really need to have those phone conversations. And so we need to adjust it. We need to find out where, where they're coming from, the good ones, the bad ones, so that we can adjust it. Um, what do we find at this table? <laughs> well, we were talking about Hassan's uh, industry with uh, security and he has a touchpad system. Stuff, but where a lot of his leads come from.
trade shows and things like that that face time with people. Um, but we're also discussing, he's used constant contact in the past, it's been up and down, but it's been a while since he's used the virtual <coughs> virtual response. Um, but even that's up and down. But we talk about you know finding ways of, who does he want to target? He wants to target the businesses who are actually installing the products and then the high-end users who are looking for the product. And so ways of identifying, using those systems, virtual responses, constant contact, well, those systems or a group of them to go after specifically the high end using the, the data mining processes we have today. Excellent. How about here? We talked about where our better leads come from, okay. or the sources of the better leads. And, Good. Um, I think two of us definitely agree that a referral is highest, the high, three of us agree that <laughs> the highest quality lead is a referral. Second one is the, is the questionnaire response that comes in off of the website because a person take the trouble to write to you, give you their phone number, and give you their email address and tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. That's, that answers some of those questions, ready yes. to buy and capable of buying. Yes. And my worst source of leads are people who call in because the way Joe said it, they want it really cheap and they, and they you know, they're just price bark shoppers and you spend a lot of time on call-ins. And then a walk-in is, is much better. And, and Brian here, he's just shown up in town. He's moved here from, from the far northeast, northwest. And so he's a CPA and is, has expressed just recently there that People don't go look for an accountant every week. They do it no. once a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Once every four years. Once every decade. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. How many how many people have changed accountants in the last five years? I haven't. One. Yeah. My well, point. I gotta catch you when you change them. Oh no, <laughs> when you move in the town. Yeah. Well, well there there's This is Florida, people are moving in all the time. You got so there, there, there's there's reasons why people change. Their accountant dies or retires, you move or he moves, or that your accountant really ticked you off. All right, mm -hmm. number yeah. one. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah. you brought up an interesting point when you were talking about where good and bad leads come from. It tends to be that when when somebody's in the research phase, regardless of how they find out about you. They, they may email, they may call, and you find that there, there's a higher level of commitment in the email than there is with a phone call. Because if I call you and I don't like what you're saying, I can just hang up, okay? Whereas if I email you, you have my email address. You can follow me, you can chase me, you can harass me, okay? And Referrals, I mean, referrals are golden. Fortunately, in the day that we live in now, you can get referrals through the internet. Facebook, Google Plus, fantastic sources for referrals. Because you can, you can even, uh, one of the ads you can do on Facebook, side note, you can run an ad on Facebook. And one of your settings that you can choose is that when, if, l let's say Brian sees one of my ads, Brian and I may not be connected. He not, you know, may not be connected to my business. But if one of Brian's friends has liked my business page or the post that I'm promoting, when Brian sees that ad, he's going to see his friend likes that. And, oh, I should check this out. Bob thinks this is really cool. You know, assuming you have a friend named Bob. Um, and, and, and that begins the process. So it's the thing that I really wanted us to, to get into on this session, this part of it, is really identifying the quality of our leads because if you can identify where your good leads are coming from 
then you know how to market. You can always spend more on marketing to get more leads. But if you don't know where the good leads are coming from, then you throw money everywhere and you get whatever kind of leads, you know? Consistent sales. Consistency is contrary to nature, contrary to life. The only completely consistent people are dead. <laughs> so one of the things here, consistent sales, know that this does not come natural. It is against your very nature. Does anybody here like a sales stream that goes up and down, up and down? No. No. Then it's going to be hard. You have to know that you can't go by your gut here. If you want to make your pipeline more consistent, you have to first identify this is not easy. This is not natural. I have to go against the way that I'm going to feel. I have to go against the way that I'm naturally going to think about things. Because we naturally think, oh, I have money, I'm going to spend it. Or money's tight, I'm not going to spend it. That's natural. And if you want your pipeline to follow that, fine. If you want a consistent pipeline, you have to separate that. It's, it, it's not easy. So what is required for consistent sales? We need a quality system to automate our marketing, whether that's a staff person, whether that's scheduling your own time, outsourcing it to a marketing firm. You need a system to automate it. Because if, it's, if, if you can't have a way to automate your marketing, your marketing's gonna be up and down. Th does that make sense? If you rely on, hey, I'm gonna deal with my marketing when I have time, you know, Bernie, how often do you have time to write a blog? Oh, yeah, you're, you're wrecking me today. <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly enough. And yet, and I know it's necessary. It's one of the most important things for online marketing. But we never have time for it. So we have to automate. And I'm just picking on Bernie. I mean, it's just an example. Who else has another example of something that you know you need to do and you never have time for it relating to marketing? Attend the right network events. Okay. Pick them and trash the rest and go to them. So that you're networking instead of not working? Yeah. Anybody else? I know it's cold, but you know. <laughs> I can never attend enough networking meetings. I, I don't know that I get business out of them, but it's it's just getting the getting the face and getting the, the recognition out there and, and just uh, constantly fail to show up to a lot of the neighbor events that I, I want to and all that. I know that there's because you're always you know, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in working in the business instead of on the business. Let me, let me point out one thing. Networking, who can tell me why networking works? How, why it gives you new business? People do business with people they, they know and trust. Okay, that's part of it. And referrals. Okay. If you go to, a, if you see somebody at a networking event, you think about them. If you don't see somebody for three years, chances are you're not going to think about them. So you see them, they're thinking about you, rubbing shoulders, trust builds. What is the difference in that interaction between actually physical face-to-face -face networking and social networking? It's physical. It's face to face. But when it comes to business, do they not accomplish the same thing? Probably they see it all the time. Yeah, they do. Not saying that you should hide in a hole and never go out in public. Which, l let me preface this. When it comes to online things, they're, they're kind of foundational, but they're, they're there to enhance what you're doing, okay? 
So you would never want to only do social media, but you don't need to only network face-to-face. -face. Social media is one of the ways that you can duplicate yourself. Gets back, okay. to, gets back to the number of touches. Absolutely. And, and you can't always just be the same touch. You can't just send an email 25 million times throughout the year. You know, they might see the email, they see something in writing that's good, they see your name and name, but, but if they see your face and get to talk to you, next time the email comes out, maybe they'll have a little bit more things. There are times when it's the right thing to go in through the, in through the uh, mail marketing. There are times to, to do, uh, you know, you have your Facebook or, or uh, a network community. It's just a, but it's touches and variety of touches. When we talk about getting a consistent pipeline, you go, you, you go to networking events when you have time, right? When you're busy, you don't have time. So one of the things I would suggest when we're talking about automating our marketing, during the times that you know you're going to be busy, don't go in person. Have videos, articles, things that you can be, you need consistent presence with your people, okay? So let's say, there's a group that you want to see you once a week. Well, during the weeks that you're going to be too busy to go to that luncheon, make sure that you're sending them a video or an article where they're going to see your face and they're going to think about you. You can do that six months, 12 months in advance. You can schedule it 12 months in advance. You know when you're going to be busy. And now you've just alleviated the stress out of it, and you're not stressing over the fact that you can't get there. You've planned it. You've automated it. And you don't even have to do it yourself. That's something you can hire somebody to do. It's almost like hiring somebody to go to an event for you. Make sense? You still need to go to some events. People still need to know that you're a real person. But that doesn't have – you can't automate that. You can only schedule so much of that. And when you're busy, it doesn't happen. So if networking is a good source of leads, you have to have a way to spread that out. Consistent activity to generate quality leads, which kind of goes back to some of what we've already been talking about. Okay, If whatever it is that generates leads, if making phone calls is what you need to do to make to generate good leads if you're cold calling, then if you're only making cold calls when you have the time, what does that do to your pipeline? Your pipeline is going to stink. Okay. The, the best, you're at your best when you're at your best. I know that sounds weird, but when you go to make a sales call to somebody, there is, you will never be in a better sales mode than after you just closed a huge deal. But when you just closed a huge deal, the last thing on your mind is going to close another deal. Right? Party. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you, some of the best sales in my life that I've ever made are when I go into that meeting and I already have a notebook full of checks that I've collected that day. I've already sold jobs. And, and you're like, you're at the point that you, don't, you it brings you to the point you no longer care if you make the sale, which is what brings you to your best because now you're actually gonna find out, hey, do you need anything? Now it's no longer about you because you don't need the sale and you can focus on the customer's needs, which is where trust comes from and makes them actually want to buy. It's kind of weird, but it works. We have to monitor our pipeline regularly. How many of us in here actually have a pipeline that we, a physical pipeline we can view for our sales? Okay, we have two. That's great. I'm glad that one of them works for me. <laughs> Tom, you want a job? <laughs> no, I already have one. <laughs> Just kidding. 
there's a saying that you can only expect what you inspect. Okay? Anybody tell me what that means? You can only expect what you can inspect. You can't look at something, you can't, you can't know what it's going to produce. But if you can't look at it and see what it's doing, how can you expect what it's going to do if you don't even know how it works? I'll break it down really, really simple. If you tell your kids to clean the room, and an hour later you ask them, did you clean your room? If they know that you're not going to go look, what are the odds that they actually clean the room? You can only expect what you inspect. If your kids know you're going to go look, they're going to clean the room. If your pipeline is not in a way that you can monitor it, if you cannot see how many leads did I get this week, where did those leads come from, and what happened to those leads? Even better yet, my existing customers. How have I touched base with my existing customers? How many of my existing customers have I asked for referrals? Okay. If you can't see these things, and every business is going to be a little bit different as far as some of the questions you're going to want to ask about that pipeline, but if you can't see how many phone calls got made today, how many emails got sent today, how many contracts got signed today, and where did that lead come from, if you can't see that as a, on a snapshot level on a regular basis, you're not going to have consistent sales. You won't. It's not natural, and it's not going to happen on its own. Okay? If you're not dead, you're not going to be consistent. <laughs> you need consistent time and systems to convert leads. Okay? Some of this may seem redundant. Just, uh, you mentioned before, when, when I finish up working with a client, lots of times I won't see them for another six months or a year. Right. But when I'm closing out that interaction or project or meeting or whatever it is, I program in when I'm going to contact them next. And, you know, some of the systems I will do it automatically for it, some I have to do manually, but still, and then I can forget about it for three months or what. I don't forget about it. They may get other touches, but that call of, hey, you're due, it's just three months out there and it shows up in the pipeline. That's how you, that's one of the ways to automate. Do you uh, ask for, ask them, well, can I call you in three months, or, or yes, or is that just a no? I I have that conversation at the at the end of the meeting or whatever, or I'll say, you know, is it you know, when would you like me to call you? And if they say, well, I'd like to sit down in three months or whatever, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, if I think they need to do it in a month, I'll tell them to negotiate. A couple things that are considered. <laughs> perfectly okay to to ask when when you're meeting with somebody and it's a good meeting whether you're actually going to do business or not as long as it's a good meeting it is perfectly acceptable to say well hey do you know three people that I could help Three people I should contact. And especially after you've just closed a deal. You've just helped somebody. Or it was a follow-up meeting. Doesn't matter. If you're on if you've finished a meeting with somebody, you're on good terms, great. But by the way, do you know three people that I should call on? Maybe I can help. Perfectly okay. The other thing is after a meeting, it is almost it's really almost expected it's so okay that you can, you can clarify to them, you say, so is it okay if I follow up with you in a week, six months, three months, whatever it is, and they're gonna say, okay, you have permission. Those are two things you, most of us don't do them, okay, except for the Toms in the world, you know. But that's why he has the time and money to go sailing. <laughs> Consistent time and systems to convert leads. You know that when you get a lead, there's work that you have to do to convert the lead to a sale, right? It doesn't just happen on its own. Everybody has a different lead cycle. 
uh, Hassan, what's the lead cycle from when you actually get a lead until you deposit the money? Job's done. On average. Some of them. Six months to a year. It depends what kind of, like, if you're dealing with the architect. Mm -hmm. Long lead cycle. Long lead cycle. Because they are, these are the people who give ideas from one point. If you're dealing with the end user, most of the time the shortcut is because they already, they know what they want. And they just kind of, they have to pull, they have the pull effect, they pull. Sure. The effect. Most of the time, after the trade show, you find that spike in the lead because people are going to the trade show for look for solution. They come back and say, okay, we saw this. They so might be actually closer to installation. Right. After that, it's, it's a long cycle in yeah. my business. And there's, it, once you've made contact with somebody, you, there's activity that has to happen between contact and contract in order to keep them as your prospect, right? You know, it's, it's a tricky question because in, nowadays a lot of people, if you approach, if you contact them, they feel they are being nurses to them. It's, it's, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like you want to be in touch with them, but at the same time, if you are in touch with them, you feel like you need them, or they, yeah, you need them, and they kind of say it's hard to get from you. So you, you, they need, they need to know, to know about your product, about your services. Keep them, you have to be in their back mind, but you cannot keep them on a regular basis. It's actually an excellent point, son, because when, when, when we're maintaining contact, um, you you have to have a reason. To contact. If there's no reason, then now you become that high pressure salesman. You know, you're annoying. Now they don't want to do business with you. But the, the amount of noise that people have in their life, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just got a, a smartphone and I'm getting wired in and, and just the noise, I, I have to, I have to cut back. Mm -hmm. you know, all the Twitters and Things like that. I, I've signed up for a bunch of them, but I'm going to start shutting things down because it's too much. What people need in order to leave an open door for communication is interesting, relevant content. And here's the thing it if you're sending somebody interesting, relevant content, it, it's not just chatter, it's appreciated. Whether they're a prospect, client, doesn't matter. You stay front of mind so they can refer you to other people. They're ready to buy when they buy. And the crazy thing about that is interesting, relevant content is the most powerful thing when it comes to online search. Think of it this way, because there's a lot about business in general that you can learn from the Google search algorithms. When somebody enters a search query, what Google is looking for is the most relevant information that that person is likely to be interested in. And they're going to look at all of your connections. They're going to read all of your emails. They're going to look at all the search history and all the search preferences of you and all of your connections in order to determine, hey, this guy and all of his friends this is what he's most likely to see. They're w most likely to want to see, okay? Well, if you're sending the same stuff through your email and your social media to, to help maintain contact with your prospects that Google wants to see, guess what? 
you get more leads anyway. So it's kind of a, you can't annoy people. Excuse me, I have to get off the floor. Did I just hear you say Google reads our emails? Yes, they do. What? They afford it from the outside. Um, yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's got to be some explanation with that, yes. Like checking on all the affairs I'm having? <laughs> Without going, without going too far, all, all the conversation about NSA and all the stuff that yeah. they're doing, NSA's really not doing much that Google and Yahoo haven't been doing for a long time. But they really scan people's emails for marketing information? Let's put it this way. If you were to send somebody an email about a golf club that you saw for sale on Amazon or whatever, okay? You send them an email. Or maybe somebody sends you an email and you go back and forth about that topic a couple of times, okay? When you are signed into Gmail or you're signed into your Android phone or you're on YouTube, there are gonna be ads at a whole bunch of other places there are going to be ads that start following you around for that golf club on Amazon. Really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But is that coming from the search term, not from the email? I mean, that's not mixed with the initial email. There's a number of ways, a number of places that that can come from, okay? I can, do a re I can set up a remarketing campaign that when you go to a website, let's... Um, Let's say we, we set up a remarketing campaign for Com Center, okay? Um, let's say we set it up on the virtual site for people. Somebody actually goes to the site. We can put a cookie on their computer, and for the next 90 days, everywhere they go on the internet, where there are ads, which remember, internet is not just a computer, but it includes your phone, your tablet, anywhere you go that there are ads anywhere the ads that we have set up for virtual office can show up for 90 days they'll follow you yeah but Eric, that's that's i think you're that, missing issues here th that's th that's email, a different thing that's something we can set up that's right. not something google's doing okay but what google's going to do and y'all is they actually read your emails and they will show you ads the same way that I can set up in a remarketing campaign. They will do that because they get paid when they show the ad. They can only read Google, can only read Gmail, and Yahoo can only read Yahoo.com mail. Well, you know, there was an interesting lawsuit last year about that. Right. Um, and I think it was a Yahoo user that was suing Google, and Google won. Because Google cannot go into a Yahoo account and read your, your stuff. Yahoo can and does, okay? But as soon as you email somebody that has a Gmail account, Google has the right to read that email. Across their network. So if it's originated from a, a Gmail account, then they can follow it? No. If it if it originates from a Gmail or goes to a Gmail, okay. Any, okay. Across their board. it doesn't matter who you're using. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You know where does Google make money? Ads. Where does Yahoo make money? Ads. Where does Bing make money? Ads. How do they know what ads to show you? It's not just your your search history. It's also the content of your emails. Huh? That's why they have three emails. So they can go yes. in and sell you. Yeah, you have figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> three emails and Nothing, lots of Nothing in life is free. <laughs> Nothing's free. Nothing's free. And now you just figured out how they pay for those free emails. Google Docs too? Google Docs is free. Are they reading that? It's all scanned as we go through. There are no secrets online. 
whether it's private network, cloud, public network, no secrets. It's all out there somewhere. Somebody can find it. Now, NSA goes a little further than most because NSA can actually connect to your device through radio waves when you're not even connected to the internet. So, I mean, this is a huge rabbit trail, but I'm going to tie this thing back in for you because look at what they're doing. Okay, in, in this world, if you don't like what they're doing, hold up your paper, hold up your pen. That's what you have to start using instead of electronic devices. If you're not ready to go back to paper and pen, then this is it. This is the world we live in. So look at what they're doing and say, well, how can I use that to my advantage? How can I tie that in? Okay, they know what they're doing. And your prospects, you can target them because you can find out, same way Google does, you can find out what their activities are. Where are they? What are they doing? What do they like? And then it's your job to show them interesting, relevant content so that when they're ready to buy, you're the first person they think of. Okay. Oh yeah, we have a uh, PowerPoint up here. <laughs> you also, for consistent sales, you also need the ability to properly fulfill production and follow up. Okay. In the same way that it's not in your nature to be consistent, nobody really likes to be an evil person. And if your fulfillment and production is not at a place to actually fulfill what you've sold, subconsciously you're really going to have a hard time pushing for sales. Everybody will. Because when you sell something, you don't want that phone call of, where's my stuff? Where is it? Or what's wrong with my stuff? I mean, so if your production's not happening, if your follow-up's not happening the way that it should, your entire sales system is going to flounder. So, I mean, this really, most people don't think of this as being sales related. But you need to make sure that your fulfillment is up to par. Automate everything that you can and know that it's not natural. So, I don't know that we really have time to go into a breakout now. Um, kind of went into some other stuff. And I know that most of us in here are not really monitoring our leads. We don't, we've already seen show hands that we don't have pipeline. If you don't have an actual pipeline, what are you guys doing to monitor your leads? How do you know what's good and what isn't? Working by your gut or? Well, I know I'm really unhappy with, with what I'm doing right now is because I, I simply touch base with the managers who are working the prospects right now. And I just keep asking them probably to the point of irritation. How's Johnson doing? How's that one doing? But we don't have a, a schedule of reviews. And I'd like to get onto that with a once a, once a week review of the list of prospects out there. How are we doing? And then move on. So right now, I think I bother with them. Have you ever read Ken Blanchard's One Minute Manager? Uh, no. If, if, if you're managing other people in this scenario, I highly recommend that you read this book before you set up your pipeline and how you're going to monitor. Um, maybe read it so you know how to monitor yourself. Ken Blanchard, The One Minute Manager. It's a short read. I mean, it's literally something you could probably sit down and read it in a day. Um, easy read, and it's, it's phenomenal. The, nobody likes, you know, constantly, you know, where are we, where are we, where are we? And it, um, and there's a lot of things in there, not saying that that's what you're doing, but, you know, if you don't have the right kind of system, that's really all, all you can do is keep coming back and, you know, where are we, where are we? So it's, um, you, you need a good system. You need some kind of a pipeline. Um, Tom, you said that you have a pipeline. Yep. What do you use? Um, daylight 
in the name of the CRM, the customer relationship. It's it, Macintosh only, so if you don't have a Mac, you're out of luck. But I mean, literally, their their lead thing is called the pipeline, mm -hmm. and it's got different stages, and you can set it up however you want. You know how many points you want, and it's you have to put the data in. You make that phone call, or you get the first call, and then you know it just follows along. Okay. So that's uh, and and if you're like Bertie, I I'm in one person or one plus a virtual assistant. There, there are lots of systems out there that have that that are, I'll say, relatively cheap that will work for you know small companies or whatever, 10-person yeah. companies. Mm -hmm. I was researching it a couple of years ago. There are a number of them out there where you could put in Bernie or somebody puts in what the status is and you get it and everybody else you want to gets it so you don't have to keep bugging them, if you want to put it that way. Probably the most powerful <laughs> system that I've seen that will work for just about anybody is Salesforce. Yeah. Um, it's, it's scalable based on the size of your company, based on the kind of reports that you want to be able to see. Um, the, most of the subscription packages are user-based. And um, with Salesforce, it, it really integrates well. You can, as, as a manager, you can see what you need to see from your phone at a glance. You can see the activity of what everybody's doing. Um, when the first thing that you need to define is what exactly do you need to be able to monitor in order to know what your people are doing in order to know because you know let's let's look at this in order to know we, we already talked about what's a good lead okay you need to be able to identify where the lead came from a lot of that can be automated but still you need to that all needs to come in where did the lead come from? What happened to it? You need to see what happened in between, okay? Because you need to be able to tell, well, hey, this lead, we put a ton of work into it, very few of them sell. It's junk, I don't want those leads. This lead, I don't sell very many of them, but I don't put very much work into it either, so, eh, maybe it's okay. This lead, I sell almost all of them, but there's so much work, I don't want it. This lead, I sell a good amount, I'm not putting too much work, those are the leads I want. How else are you going to know what advertising means work for you? How are you going to know? Throw a bunch of money around and see how it works. Well, how long do you does it take for something to work? If you run... Newspaper ads, assuming that your demographic is reading that newspaper. How many newspaper ads for how long do you need to run in order to close a sale? Anybody know? Yeah. Ten. You need to be in that newspaper one to two times a week for about eight weeks before you can expect a sale. That's a lot of newspaper ads. It's a lot of money. That's a pretty high cost per lead. Newspaper is not something that you do expecting direct response. You, you know, you, can, you put some things in there to try to get people, but newspaper has more to do with branding. Okay? You, you, you want enough new, newspaper ads that people Oh, yeah, yeah, he's been around, he's been around. They keep seeing it over and over. They don't have to see it every day. If they see it once, twice a week, they're going to think they see it every day. Okay? When you're in magazines, okay, how many times and for how long do you need to be in a magazine, assuming that's your demographic, before you're going to close a sale? Or not, not close a sale, but, good, but get a lead that's going to close. Just last week, I was I, a CPA who was a former tenant here and outgrew us and went out and established a large office as a result, but he served lots of our clients, so he comes through uh, the lobby once in a while and run into him and ask uh, how he was doing, and he says, it is unbelievable. I have never been so busy. I said, so what did it? He said, you're not going to believe it. He said, yellow pages. I said, come on. 
I use the yellow pages to hold the door open. Uh, he says, no, online. He says, I ran yellow pages online for six months. And he says, my business has been just been growing exponentially from this single source. Do you have any response to that or I do. Ob observation? The, the reason that there was success is because when you run an ad with yellow pages online, your ad ha is pretty likely that it's going to show up fairly high, okay? Not necessarily your ad, but Yellow Pages ad that will redirect to you, okay? The, because it's not branded for you, even though it works, it is successful, because it's not branded for you, there's two downfalls. One, as soon as you stop paying Yellow Pages, you have nothing, nothing follows you. The traffic that you were getting, Google doesn't really care because that's obviously paid and you were paying somebody besides Google, so no credits. The other thing is there's no brand recognition from people seeing it because it's not you, okay? It's the yellow pages about that need. But it works. You can do the same thing with Facebook ads that are branded to you and Google ads that are branded to you. And both of those things are going to have ongoing effect for you. So that even if you stop the ads, there's still ongoing SEO value, there's still ongoing branding value, okay? There are tons of directories that you can, that you can use to, to start getting some leads that way. And I don't recommend them. They're usually, they might be a low cost up front, but the, the return of when you start getting business, you start getting business six months of running those ads? No, okay. you said it was instant. Oh, okay, you said it was six months. No, that's how long he had been doing it. Just, okay, in okay. Other words, in, over a six month period, okay. it was a huge increase. Because usually when you do ads, you're, you're yeah. a little more instantaneous. What's, what's but it would be interesting to know are people going to Yellow uh, Pages online or right going to Google? Right and Google now. is pulling Yellow Pages as the first response. That would be interesting to know. Most people, when you look at, when I've looked at the analytics, most people are going to Google, entering a general search term, and Yellow Pages shows up. So it turns out the key word that you put, that you the, Yellow Pages happen to be matching that key you, word. You, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I, there's, when it comes to online, the most important part of all of it is the keyword phrase. Knowing what people are going to be typing into the search query that is relevant to your business. That is the A number one point. Because if you don't have, if you don't start there, the rest of it doesn't matter. All of the different things that you can do in marketing, there's a cycle to it. And you need to know which one works for you. Because it's not that newspapers are bad, it's not that magazines are bad, it's not that online is everything. It's not that, it's a balance. There's, I, I've, you know, I, I know I've gone over this before here, there's only three parts to marketing. You have branding, you have inbound marketing, you have outbound marketing. Inbound marketing is the people that are already searching for what you do. It's inbound marketing is what the yellow pages used to be. If you wanted something, you picked up the phone book, okay? Or you went and asked your neighbor. That's social media now, okay? People are already searching for what you do, and when we, yeah, as business owners, when we think of marketing, we think of outbound, where we're spending money to get in front of people that may or may not be interested in what we have to offer. And the fact of the matter is that if you have a good inbound marketing, presence, not only are you getting all the low-hanging fruit, but it will double the return on investment of your outbound marketing. Double. Stats are there. But I miss what you were talking about, outbound. What, what outbound is marketing that? is when you're doing newspaper, magazine, anything where you're paying to get in front of people that may or may not be interested in what you're offering. Okay? Paid advertising. Good inbound marketing. If somebody can search for it and you show up, Guess what? 
your outbound marketing, the return is going to be double because 86% of all purchases will be Googled before they make the buying decision. And if you don't show up when they Google you, even though they found you in the newspaper, you're not going to get the sale. Those are the numbers. Okay. So know which, identify what is it that you need to, to see in your pipeline so that you know where the lead came from, what happened to it at the end, and how long it took to, to get there. You've got to be able to monitor the activity. Manageable expenses. Able to be managed, controlled, or accomplished without great difficulty. And you know, really, I could just stop by saying if you can establish a pipeline and automate your marketing so that your marketing is consistent, you're going to have manageable expenses because they're not going to be up and down, up and down. You know, sales are down, so I need to market. Well, when sales are down, do you have the money to market? Probably not. When do you have the money to market? When sales are up. Well, you're too busy. You don't have time to market. Okay? So, what I wanted to um, go through is I really wanted to get into a calendar here. Kind of running out of time, so we'll just kind of um, jump through. You, you know that your, your system, you know, this demographic especially, this area, you know that your sales are going to tend to cycle up and down. You need to identify in your calendar first and foremost, when do I have the time to do things personally, like go to the networking meetings, schedule them, and know that you can't blow it off. Those are the meetings you've got to make. The times when you know you're going to be busy and you can't go to the networking meetings have something in place to replace you. And that's just talking about, you know, like social media and networking. Everything that you find that works for you, if you know that a certain magazine is going to work for you, then by golly, you need to know when to be in the magazine and make sure it happens. Sit down at the beginning of the year and say, okay, these are the months that I want to be in your magazine. I'll Commit to them now, and what kind of a deal will you make me? It's a whole lot better than to have that rep calling you every single month trying to get you to place an ad. You're going to save a ton of money, and you're going to save a ton of time, and now you have something consistent. If you're doing trade shows, you know sales are going to spike after the trade show. You know that it's not like you can say, hey, I want a trade show here. You know there's only certain trade shows. So leading up to the trade show, after the trade show, you know you're going to be busy working on that. So you need to automate everything else that you're going to do, and you know that you've you got to keep a drip going because all of a sudden you're going to be busy. You can't disappear during the time that you're busy, so schedule it. And then in between the trade shows, what are you going to do? you got to have something else. Schedule it, automate it so that it works. And I'm putting some of you to sleep now. Um, this is a big one. Setting aside funds for the charitable events, it's going to happen. People are going to be coming in saying, hey, will you sponsor this, that, whatever. Budget it, set it aside, break it down by quarter, by month, whatever. Don't just say at the beginning of the year, I got this much, because it'll be done in three months, okay? Break it out throughout the month. Somebody comes to you, I mean, this makes it really easy. Somebody comes to you and say, hey, will you sponsor this? If it's something you're gonna, you know you're going to do every year, set it aside, put it in the budget. The rest of it, have the money set aside. Somebody says, hey, will you come sponsor this? Well, is it something that I support? Okay. Is it left in the budget? Nope. I'm sorry. I can't. Wish I could. If it's in the budget, do it. You know, you, it's just exposure. It's not like you get a lot out of them. But they are good. Um, makes people think you're a nice person and all that. And it does help with the trust. So break it out and have some of that happening. Live by that calendar and budget. Just set it up. Your first, if you've never done this, your first year is going to be kind of a, a guess. Write it up. Take your numbers that you have from last year and plan it out the best you can and live by it. Make notes so that when it comes to writing it next year, you can do an even better job. And we're, we're not going to do that. This is the best part. If you're going through hell, 
Keep going. Take a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's that's um. A friend. <laughs> <laughs> Take an enemy. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. You know, sales is a funny thing. You have to market to have sales. And the two are always, they're, they're, they're going to be polar enemies against each other, always. And it's not natural. It's not in your natural instinct to set up a consistent pipeline. But that's what we all need. If you want to be able to manage growth, think of all the times when you know, you're, you're staffed and equipped for your busiest times. Think of all the times in the year when you're not there. Now, if you could spread that out, think of how many more dollars you could do how much more profit you would have at the end of the year, okay? So, one minute left, any questions? <laughs> All right. No, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll turn it over to you, Bernie.